Hello everyone, welcome to the FMCG guys um, in a special video edition of the podcast. If you're listening to the audio, it's regular audio, but you can also find the full video on YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, hi, uh, good to see you for once. Um, I'm, as you know, Daniel Torres, um, your usual co-host um, and accompanied by an unusual co-host as you can see below you're probably wondering who's the guest today and who's the other co-host so Christina Nicolau is my co-host for the day and maybe for a few days more hi Christina thanks for joining hi, thank you so much for having me I'm thanks. very excited to be part of this project Likewise, likewise. Th thanks for taking the leap of faith and uh, coming into the, the clan that Efrain and I were managing <laughs> pretty much single-handedly until now. So for the audience to get to know you a little bit, Christina, maybe Christina or Christine, we had this conversation before, you go by both names. So <laughs> depending on what language you speak in. So maybe you can tell the audience a bit about yourself, where you come from, what you're doing yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Christine in English because of an English teacher that decided so many years ago. Uh, Christina in Greek. I am Greek. I'm based in Athens. And I've been in FMCG practically for all my career. I've done um, quite a variety of roles. I started my career in supply chain, then moved to sales, marketing, now strategy. I had joined PNG quite a few years ago, then moved to Diageo, and I have just joined the Coca-Cola company. So I'm very excited to meet all these amazing guests that you guys have here, Daniel, and to get to learn more about the world of FMCG. Yeah, and I think that uh, given your background, I think that I will learn a lot from you as well, and the, and the guests as well. And I think the only negative thing I can say to you is that I don't know what what you have in your head to join us but well that's your problem <laughs> <laughs> so so our other guest today is um somebody that i've known for a long time that i've been very keen to bring to this public stage for a while also has a png background um and this is paola pochi joining us from imperial brands hi paola hello daniel thank you for having me here i'm very happy to be with you it's it's a pleasure, and we were talking before um, because you're man managing a very big region that we can go to in a minute. But you're actually London based, and that's where you're joining us from, right? That's correct. Yes, yes, yes. I'm uh, based in London because the headquarter of uh, Imperial Brands is in London, uh, so all the executive leadership team is there. Uh, but the reality is, as you can imagine, I'm you know I'm traveling a lot anyway. So London, I see it primarily in the weekends. So let's say. Yeah, which I remember when you moved to London, you were very happy that you didn't have to drive up and down everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was the idea, but uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. So so maybe you can tell us a bit, uh, Paola, and, and to the audience a bit about what your your current role is um, at Imperial at Imperial Brands. And if you like, actually, since I referred to it a bit about your, your background in, in P&G, because you did a lot of interesting stuff there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I will introduce myself. So as you said, I'm, I'm uh, Paola Pocci. I've been working in uh, um, marketing first and then business in general, general management uh, for the, I mean, in general, it's uh, 24 years that I'm around, let's say, uh, of which 22 in PNG. So I'm a PNG veteran, I have to say, and the last two in Imperial. Um, in PNG, I've been uh, work, I've been working starting in marketing and then moved to general manager, but in uh, several categories: uh, laundry, prestige, skincare, personal beauty care. That's the typical PNG um, pattern, let's say. Um, and also in several geographies, I've been uh, I started in Italy and Italian, um, and then I spent some time in Geneva uh, when I was working in prestige on a global business. So that was the time I started learning how to cope with the complex geographies, let's say. And then I spent my last years of PNG in China, five years in China. That has been an extraordinary, extraordinary experience, really, really. The, the, the part of my life where supposedly I learned the most, you know, because the most challenging. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, after the PNG China experience, I got this uh, incredible opportunity in Imperial uh, that I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing right now in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and basically what I do is um, 
I manage what the ACE region from a PNL standpoint. I will explain what is ACE region because every company split the geographies in different way, different ways. So basically, we are organized as a, in three regions: uh, US, Western Europe, and then ACE. And ACE is basically Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Central Eastern Europe. So. If, you know, it's pr pr pretty much everything more on the East plus Africa to make it simple. <laughs> so it's very, very diverse. And maybe I will also say a little bit of a couple of words of what is Imperial because uh, perhaps it's a little bit less known versus uh, PNG. Um, so Imperial Brands is a company that uh, produces tobacco products and uh, um, the less harmful tobacco products that enable smokers to quit smoking, which is something I'm very passionate about. So, um, of course, what we do, um, we offer uh, responsibly, we offer tobacco choices to consumers that are already smoking, uh, and we incentivize smokers to to move into less harmful products, uh, which is uh, something very, very important to me. Um, effectively, it's a very, you know, you talked about FMCG. It is a very FMCG sector. Uh, you know, basically the, the areas uh, to work around are the typical four Ps or six Ps, uh, how many Ps eventually they have become, um, where, of course, uh, you know, you may have areas that are more important, like distribution and pricing may be more important uh, in our category than, uh, than in some other categories in FMCG or in beauty care, for example. Um, however, the, the principles are very, very similar. Wow, like... You have an amazing CV, Paola. You've done so many different things and a lot of transitions with the latest one from PNG to Imperial, not just changing companies, but I would say it's also like a big change in terms of industries. And what I'm thinking is mostly you went from a very unregulated industry compared to tobacco to a very regulated one. So do you see like what are the challenges that you see in this change that you had to go through and how do you handle this? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I, I would step back a little bit and say that uh, overall the change has been massive beyond the uh, regulation and a regulation, let's say. Um, of course, I think, you know, whenever you change, a I, I've been spending 22 years in the same company. So the first challenge was to change company at all, you know, to cool. Um, that was a very interesting challenge and I really wanted to do. Um, and I, I really understood that the first uh, big thing is about, uh, you know, the company culture. Uh, Christine, for example, you mentioned several changes you did. You also started from PNG. Um, I'm sure you have learned your way to adjust to different cultures, right? But at the same time, supposedly, to keep yourself in the change, and that is what I'm trying to do as well. Um, so that has been the first thing. The second thing, of course, has been for me the first time being the in in the executive leadership team of a of a FTSE 100 company. You know, which which has been a big thing. Now you mentioned this uh, regulation. You know, being in a regulated category versus unregulated category. This is a, a big one, of course. Now there has been some something that uh, helped me because uh, if you think about it uh, every fmcg category is uh, in a sense regulated right mm -hmm. uh and i'm sure you remember the christine png is also very compliant when it comes to regulation whatever the regulation is for example mm -hmm. um product claims uh what can you do what you cannot do right and png has uh, always held very very high standard in that sense this has helped me a lot when uh, I went into Imperial because, uh, first of all, uh, of course, uh, the level of regulation that you have in a in a nicotine industry is much st much stricter, right? And this is because for the right reasons, because governments want to make sure that the access to these products, uh, first of all, is really controlled. You don't have underage, and also you don't have new consumers uh, entering into the category. So now the whole principle is uh, there is a pool of consumers uh, that are already smoking and we need to serve these consumers because, you know, in general, we are not in a prohibition 
uh, uh, environment, right? So, so the most important, the regulation is about uh, making sure that the consumer pools doesn't get bigger, and especially in some areas that can be tricky, like underage and so on and so forth. And uh, what I was very happy to see is that Imperial is very, very principle-based and very strict on being compliant, not only not to be in trouble, but out of belief, uh, you know, out of belief that this is really part of our mission to responsibly offer products uh, to existing smokers as opposed to you know any gray area. So the, the learning that I had in PNG helped me um, to understand that the principles are the same and it's just about you know adjusting to the regulation that is slightly different. Now, what is the difference though? Two differences I would say versus before. First is that the change of regulation happens much faster. Um, so one of the things I've seen is uh, because in general governments are very keen to protect consumer health, um, the pace of uh, adjustment of regulation in order to protect citizens um, can be faster and faster and normally stricter, of course. For example, um, you know, the, the, the flavors. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, 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 there are some consumers that are using flavors and the, the Europe is going into a much stricter regulation when it comes to flavors. And these, of course, these are things that uh, require the industry to adjust, uh, um, uh, you know, everything in terms of, you know, product design, supply chain, um, go to market and et cetera, to make sure that you are compliant with the regulation from day one, of course, right? So, so I think this requires agility in, uh, in adjustment to the, re to, to the regulation. Um, I think the other thing, which is uh, a big difference from more from a business model uh, is uh, this thing that I was saying about, uh, you know, the whole point is you have an existing product consumer pool and uh, you absolutely need to be clear that you're not going to attract new consumers to the category product pool, um, to the category pool, uh, puts a completely different lens to the way you think about the business. Um, because, you know, when I was in PNG, especially in China, I remember the whole game was about how do we attract new consumers to the category? How do we drive trial? Uh, how do we develop the category together with the customers? Now, this is the opposite. The categories are shrinking because there is less and less people smoking, you know, and that's the right thing, by the way. Um, and it's really important that we don't know none of the industry attracts new consumers to the pool. So the whole game, the whole business game is about market shares in um, um, a shrinking consumer pool and then strategic revenue management. You know, how do you drive incremental pricing um, in a sustainable way uh, in order to have a, a sustainable business model. So, so this is pretty much the, the, the shift. And uh, the interesting thing is that it was a very interesting intellectual challenge um, and giving me uh, new business tools from a business model, uh, you know, and the opportunity to learn new things. What you're saying is so interesting. Like, the essence of it, which is being responsible, is something that you see that already existed. Like you've lived in this environment through PNG with just kind of lighter regulations that are not changing as fast. Well, if I understand correctly, now with this fast change of regulations, it's not something that's just impacting marketing, but you need to have a very agile full supply chain that is able to adapt to those changes that are happening. While it's also a completely different mindset, yeah, PNG is so much focused on let's grow the category. Let's work together with our customers to attract more consumers to premiumize the category. While now it's more of like a, this market share game, as you said, and a full RGM work on how do we do the right revenue management. That, that's right. Uh, I think the only thing I would say is that uh, uh, before entering in the category, I was a little bit question mark on what are the marketing possibilities in the category, right? Because in mm -hmm. general, first of all, most of the markets are dark. That's what we say. Yeah. We mean you cannot communicate. Um, 
and uh, and second you struggle from i mean and i i used to smoke by the way so i know the category right but it's not so easy to really make a very easy dis differentiation between the brands right in reality what i've understood by you know having now spent almost two years in this role is that uh, as I said before, the, the key game is, the key business game is market share and strategic revenue management. And from a market share standpoint, um, in an existing or shrinking product pool, you need to attract consumers that before were using other brands, right? So in a dark market, I realized that you can uh, do marketing, let's say, but you need to do it in a very specific, very responsible way within the tools that you have. For example, one of the things uh, that you do normally is to engage with the sellers, you know, with the, with the people selling at the store. And that is absolutely um, allowed, right? So basically we, we call it advocacy. Uh, so uh, having a relationship with the people at the store is one of the key levers to explain how your products perform, uh, what is the key point of difference um, versus the others. And, uh, and it, so it's very interesting that it's like, you know, when, when people are blind, they develop a better uh, ear uh, capability. Yeah. It's the same thing here. You cannot communicate with billboards or big advertising. So then what are the muscles that you create to be very compliant? Um, so you understand that also marketing has a has a role to play in that sense. So you kind of find new pockets of creativity within the existing framework. Precisely, absolutely, within the existing and within the compliance. You know that that's absolutely. something that I really really want to clarify. Now the new generation products, uh, which is the world of you know the e-cigarettes, to make it simple. Mm -hmm. um, this is slightly different because it's still, you know, the regulation is less strict because there is a recognition about the fact that this is a very good way to quit smoking um, as an interim step. Um, so there is a little bit of more space to communicate, depending, by the way, on the different markets. Um, so this is an area where uh, we do a little bit more in that sense. And, but always in the spirit of, um, uh, you know, talking to existing smokers. So mm -hmm. and how the existing smokers can actively go to do these new generation products uh, uh, that are less harmful. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, the advocacy marketing. It, it works actually quite similar in, in pharma, for example. Mm. So it's it's an interesting parallelism there. A, a big thing, like when you change companies, especially when you come from such a big company, but more than big company, actually a strong culture like PNG is moving the culture shift into another company. And there's one thing about PNG that I think is very special about it. This is which is that you know virtually everyone in the senior levels or in the whole organization is like homegrown. So you're an example, right? Finish university, join PNG, then grow from within. And that's where the talent pool from PNG comes from. And now you're at, a, at a Imperial Brands, which is, you know, I'm sure there's people that have grown from within, but I think that the vast majority, especially at the senior levels, are external hires. How are you perceiving this cultural difference, but especially related to this aspect? You know, that was one of the big uh, challenges, to be very honest with you. Um, I think what, uh, so let me start with the, the, the culture change. The cultural change was definitely there, right? And uh, the, there were several aspects uh, um, that were, you know, uh, identifying or visualizing this uh, cultural difference. And one of the things that I realized is also, you know, a European company versus an American company has also some aspects in there, which honestly, I, I didn't imagine. But the, there's, you know, the, the, there's a lot about relationship in a European company that I've, uh, I've understood, you know, the building really a trusted relationship is very important as opposed to having transactional kind of relationship uh, which would be less productive however one thing that i would say for me one of the reasons why i believe it was less difficult for me to um 
to change culture despite having spent 22 years in PNG. And I totally agree with you. The culture in PNG is super strong. I mean, we always say we are all the same. We are all the same wherever you are, and except especially if you spend so much time in the company. In my case, I think what helped me tremendously was to to have the experience in China, because um, I mean, still China, of course, China PNG is PNG. On the other side, the the local cultural aspect. Huh? was so strong that it almost uh, it was almost stronger than the png culture in that sense so it proved me to have to confront with something completely different versus what i was used to, like in a european uh, environment or in a in a american environment within png that enabled me to develop muscles about you know confronting me with a diverse environment um and in fact uh, it was more difficult for me to adjust to PNG China than to adjust to uh, to Imperial from a cultural oh, standpoint. That's um, right. Because I think it was not because it was not different from PNG, but because I already um, understood what were the areas that I had to to be careful about and to re self reflect about the respect uh, of. Uh, me entering into another organism as opposed to me having to export my way. I, I think that that's the, and I mean, you know, PNG people are very strong and normally quite talented and so on and so forth, but the risk is they go into another place and they go like, okay, let me teach you, you know? Yeah. And that doesn't work. Uh, what is important is to find, you know, it's, of course, you need to, share your experience but you also need to be very respectful of uh, what's going on and the, how the company has operated right so you find the middle ground yeah no that's true and as a as a hiring manager now that you've had like the possibility of hiring people externally <laughs> i'm gonna make it very black or white what do you prefer only hiring internally but hiring great people or having the possibility of doing both <laughs> Well, that's a super good question, and uh, you may be surprised on this one. Uh, um, in the last two years uh, that I've been in Imperial, I think I've hired externally only two people, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the people I kept, the internal people. Um, and I think, again, I mean, I, I, I've been in starting, um, how to say, I'm quite passionate person in team building, um, and I've learned the, the the possibility to extract value from different and diverse talent pools. So to be very honest with you, at the beginning when I joined Imperial, I was really reflecting about that and let's see, you know, who, you know, would be in line with the agenda that I want to drive and who wouldn't. Um, and there was a very honest conversation about what was my vision and I wanted to accelerate the business and make it a little bit more regular and predictable and so on and so forth with all the leadership team. And I found a very good response by the people because, you know, from a skill set standpoint, the, the people uh, reporting to me were very, very strong in terms of, you know, having worked in the category since a long time and actually passing a very strong selection process because also they are very senior leaders. So, I mean, the, the people I, I had the pleasure to work with are anyway very, very strong, right? Um, so, but also from a culture standpoint and from a pace of change standpoint, that was more the, the question. And what I've seen is that most of the people have really embraced. So I've been conscious of not changing when there wasn't the, the need. In a couple of cases, I had to make it, and so I made it, right? So, but I think that the point is, I don't feel there is a recipe, uh, and I don't particularly like, but that's my personal choice. I don't particularly like the notion of uh, you come as a new leader and all the leadership team needs to be new because then it's the people that are loyal to you and are the people that understand you. In my case, um, I prefer to, to see and where the mix goes, let's say, you know, if, if we can have a good mix of internal and external. Yeah, and it certainly does give an incentive to the people seeing that they have the possibility to grow and it's not always someone new, albeit having, you know, 
the first pair of eyes that some in some cases it's needed and yeah. it also motivates the people to see that there is this path in front of them and as Daniel said like PNC has this very very strong culture of promoting from within yet not everyone has such an impressive career path and success within the company as you did. So do you feel like there were some specific traits perhaps that helped you in your success within this massive organization of PNZ? So that's an interesting question. I've been reflecting on this uh, over time also because as a senior person, you try also to understand who you are and uh, who you're not and where you can give the best value also. No? So I, I believe there's a couple of things that, enable me to to make it in png and by the way there is one that is not a really a trait but it's there is luck right so let's face it <laughs> sometimes there is the luck point about you know being in the right place in the right moment but that let's put it aside because we don't control it right um i think there's a couple of things i think the number one is uh, um i have been really inspired by the drive for results. So I think, you know, now this seems like an advertising on, on, on myself, but I promise you it's really true. Um, I'm not a political animal at all. Um, and uh, so I never made a career out of uh, being part of a network of people successful that then, you know, then I'm part of that group, right? Um, I, I've always focused much more the effort, my effort on driving results uh business results and organization results um i think that's my natural space um and uh, what i also found uh, as a safe space for me because if you have that one uh, you're always safe whoever is the boss you know even if the boss changes and that this is also what i like by the way you know it's a the intellectual challenge about being inspired by what is right for the business. I find this, by the way, something very helpful also when, you know, in all the, these uh, big companies, you always have some natural and intentional tensions. So say, for example, when you have a matrix organization and you have the function versus the business or, or up versus down or whatever, right? You always have some debate points. And what I found easy is when I'm always inspired by what, is what I believe is right for the business and what uh, what consumer wants, um, then all the conversations in this tension moment are very simple because it's never about your personal agenda. It's never about what I want versus what you want uh, and it's my territory versus your territory. Uh, this releases you know, the tension and puts the dialogue in a much relaxed way. Um, I think the other part that I believe uh, enabled me to get to where uh, I am now is um, a good combination of uh, strategy and uh, operation. Um, what I normally do when I take an assignment or whatever assignment is, I, I do it a little bit by the book, the first uh, 90 days or 100 days to really reflect on what I want the agenda to be my agenda, my vision, let's say, um, because I think it's very important to have a North Star. Uh, where do you want to go? What's the legacy you want to have? And then this will change over time, can change, but at least you have an hypothesis, right? Which also help you to drive the organization to a certain direction, as opposed to, you know, we talk about my region is quite complex, right? If you don't have a very clear vision, a very clear framework or strategy, you can get lost and the organization can get lost and everyone can go into a different direction. So this is not gonna work. However, I also believe that what is super important is to complement this strategy with being an operational machine. And I think this is a quite good at. Um, whenever there is something that, uh, you know, with the leadership team we decide to do, my first, my immediate next question is, okay, how do we bring it to life? What's going to be the drumbeat? What's going to be the drumbeat of meeting? When are we going to make the decision? Who presents it? Who gets the approval? Um, what do we do month one, month two, month three, month four, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think sometimes this is a little bit underestimated by senior management. Um, it's almost like, 
oh, the senior management does the beautiful strategy and then somebody else who will take care of uh, um, bringing it to life. Um, I take a lot of pride in this, honestly, because then it's where you start seeing the, the results coming. Um, and I mean, very humbly, I can say that, for example, in this region, um, in two years, we have started seeing the results being uh, you know, already quite accelerated by that. Clear strategy, disciplined operation, you see the results. Uh, it's quite simple. I, I don't think we are creating the nuclear bomb, right? Sounds so, easy like this. You have an easy job at, at the end. <laughs> but I think sometimes we overcomplicate. Uh, <laughs> so. To tell you the truth to me, this sounds very inspiring and motivating because you hear many times people feeling like they cannot progress because, and they say that it's because, for example, they lack the political aspect of the workplace. And when we hear such a senior leader as yourself saying like, this is about the essence of the business and how you go about having clear strategies, taking care of the discipline in operations and keeping it simple in the conversations and focused, it feels like very motivating to me that it's not just about um, this navigating the political environment, there is another way. I believe so. I really believe so. And I believe this is more and more the case also because, uh, I mean, now all the big companies are having a very, you know, important, uh, um, in, they are having important statements about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, in my opinion, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only about gender diversity or uh, uh, minorities or these kind of things, uh, but it's also about, uh, uh, you know, enabling different leadership styles uh, across the board. Um, and that is why, at least in my experience, uh, you know, when you have an impact on the business and uh, you have an a positive impact to the organization uh, um, and in a context where companies are really embracing this notion of diversity, I believe that the world is much more open. Uh, to different profiles than it used to be before. Yeah, I think it. I think it's the only, probably only way to go. Also, like in the more globalized world, I think it's one. I think it's necessary to like reflect your audience, and secondly, also to reflect, um, yeah, like just for like diversity of thought. It's just better, and also to t to attract talent at the end. It's like. I think that people will demand a diverse environment because it will just make their job more interesting ultimately. Absolutely. And also I believe to provide role models to different talents. Um, I am a strong believer about the, the and really about the notion that diversity provides a, a better context for the business yeah. um, in uh, several aspects. First of all, because this provides a better psychological safety to a broader audience and I believe you know especially in the lower level you by definition you have a more diverse pool um, and uh, providing role models to a more diverse audience creates it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of creating the psychological safety um, and the inspiration to to more people versus the dominant group the second part is to your point daniel i think the world has become so complex uh, right now that we need we must talk to more uh, complex audiences um the, the consumer pools need to become more diverse by definition and if if management is only really represented by 1% of the population by definition you will fail uh, and it will not work so um, and then I think the third is that I also believe that diversity of thoughts brings a better outcome from a business because you really see the things from different perspective and then eventually you get to a greater outcome. Yeah. One last one about PNG, by the way. So if you have to look back into it, because you spent, I think you said 22 years there. Um, what would you be your like? main takeaway from that experience like if there's one thing that you would take away with from with you from it what would it be good good one i think it would be good is never good enough and what is good for this year will not be good for next year 
uh, I think that is the thing. I and I loved it honestly. Uh, this kind of lack of complacency um, and uh, always looking for improvements from uh, you know business standpoint, business model, organization, being always ahead of the game um, was something that of course made you out ongoing feel like uh, always a little bit out of your comfort zone and that is great you know because that pushed the, each of the individuals always to learn new things never stay still and but I think the, the, the thing that really on this even on the business right these um, always you know thinking what is good for today is not going to be good for tomorrow in a context like PNG I believe has been really the, the recipe for success uh, for existing for I don't know, now is 180 years, uh, 190 is, I, I stopped counting. Um, for example, uh, like, I mean, to give an example, I remember that uh, um, because I was starting from marketing and every couple of years, there were new uh, notions to learn. Like uh, the, the five years ago, perhaps uh, there was this notion about uh, the performance media, like the digital media one-to-one -one through, um, through all the artificial intelligence tools. And most likely, you know, this wouldn't have been necessary at that time uh, because still most of the business model was about social media, normal social media. But the, the notion is uh, what's going to come in three years? What is the muscle that the company- And it's doing this doing? year that everybody's, that it's become mainstream, right? So- Exactly. So, so I think that was really fantastic uh, and enabled the company to always be ready, let's say. Yeah. This is about a company that's kind of like in love with the future consumer and thinking like, what's the next question I need to be answering now? And that's kind of what's driving all this progress and even like the disruption were needed and seeing the opportunities because everything exactly. has the opportunity there. Exactly. I think that the, 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 the whole point is the disruption is an opportunity. And I have to say that this notion, consciously or unconsciously, I brought it with me. Um, and for example, whenever, I mean, of course, uh, these couple of years in, in Imperial, like all the companies, it was not in Imperial, have been impacted by some challenges like the inflation, uh, supply chain disruption, cost of goods in growth and so on and so forth. But the, the, what I brought with me from PNG was always to look at uh, the solution approach, you know, fine, it is what it is, everyone is impacted by that, what do we do about that? How do we take the problem in a different way? And um, and I think this is a very good uh, angle to keep in your toolbox, let's say. Absolutely. And that's why usually PNG alumni kind of like connect easier when they find themselves outside because yeah, they have definitely. this mindset, right? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I would like to go back to the previous conversation a bit because I think it's super interesting about diversity, equity, and inclusion. As now you are in like senior leadership, and um, there is this um, um, research that's being published by Lean In Organization and McKinsey. And what I thought was really interesting was in the 2022 one, um, the data showed that in entry level jobs, it was 48 women, 48%. 52 men, so quite a good balance. But when you get to the C level, it's only 26%. So you see that there is kind of um, a lot more challenges for women to advance to higher uh, level leadership positions. And I would really like to hear your thoughts on that as you have managed to go through this path. Are women held on higher standards? Um, it's really the society challenges uh, are they are strong like balancing homework and uh, work at the office what's your view on that yeah i think uh, it's a uh, first of all it's quite sad that it's still the case despite uh, recently you know several companies have declared a different intention so it's still sad um look i believe this is driven by a combination of reasons uh, um uh, first of all, I, I mean, I'm sure in most of the companies, there's no intentional discrimination. So it's not that this happens because uh, we don't want women, we don't believe they are good enough and so on and so forth. I think uh, a lot of things happens out of, uh, how to say, um, some 
automatic mechanism. If you think about it, like uh, as a senior leader, a lot of recruitment uh, happens by affinity. I also, you know, tend to, you, you mentioned before, PNG alumni has a special thing. Of course, uh, I have to admit when I see a PNG CV, uh, oh, let me look at it with more attention. I have to admit that. And it's not because I don't want to be fair. It's just a human thing. And I suppose that if uh, until and unless you will have uh, the big majority of leaders still being men, they will automatically um, unconsciously go by affinity, you know, and by similarity. So I think there is a bias, unconscious bias there uh, that creates a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The second thing I believe, uh, and this may be not uh, very popular uh, as uh, what I'm saying, I believe women held them back. You know, sometimes women don't believe in themselves. Um, I, I have been, uh, you know, uh, having a mentor of some women in Imperial and uh, one person told me, oh, I was thinking perhaps to become a general manager, but uh, I don't know that I can do it because normally this is, uh, you know, if you look at the traits of a general manager, these are the traits of a man. You need to be decisive, you need to be fast, you need to be authoritative, authoritative. and that, that is when I, I started becoming emotional, like, that's not true, you know? <laughs> Absolutely, there is no one way to be. And uh, th but sometimes, again, if you don't have, if women don't have role role models, sometimes they also put themselves in a corner, saying, "If nobody has done it, I will not make it." Right? Um, and several times, and this I have to say happened to me as well. Uh, when you make it uh, as a woman, you risk to have the imposter syndrome, the syndrome of uh, oh. Why am I even in this position, right? Maybe they, maybe I'm a fraud. It happens very often uh, that, you know, these kind of things. So I think these are, you know, and then not to mention all the personal choices about, you know, work-life balance and et cetera. This for me is more of a personal choice and, you know, I, I you know, it's something not to touch upon. But if the woman finds a way to balance these two aspects, which in my opinion is possible, by the way, um, then I think the reasons why this doesn't happen is more related to what I said, you know, a little bit of unconscious mm -hmm. bias in the selection process, uh, women even not, not even leaning in and self-promoting themselves. And when they make it perhaps having the risk of, uh, I'm not good enough for this job and that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think... Uh, in order really to break this uh, pattern, we need, it need, what is needed is a very, very structured approach. I don't believe what, what can uh, help is to hire people from outside here and there randomly and uh, just tick the box. Uh, you can do that as an emergency. Um, as a tactic. Yeah, as a tactic or emergency thing. But for me, what really is needed is more an intentional uh, pipeline process like you identify for example you want and it may take a little bit of more time but I think that is the only structural approach uh, as a company you want to have 50 50 in the executive leadership team in five years then you start from four level down um, that is the the numbers that I want to have these are the talents that I believe could make it these are the talents that I'm going to nurture I'm going to make training programs for those people. I'm going to make mentoring pro programs for those people. And then I start really nurturing because then, by the way, then you are more sure that these women will succeed because the thing you don't want to do is then putting people in those places and then, you know, not making it successful. And then you can create even the opposite pro problem. Um, in Imperial, we are doing that very, very intentionally. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, Imperial is very committed on this uh, on this path and then part of it, of course, um, but we are doing it in a very structured and, uh, and strategic way. And I think that that makes me feel good because I believe it's going to be sustainable. So connected to what you were saying before, it's about having the strategy and your Northern Star, but also having setting the right operations to make it right. through the years. It, it really is like this. You're right. Precisely. It is like this. Yeah, because there's a lot of PR related to this topic that we all see around which is good but i think maybe this pr is is lacking execution at the end of the day no 
Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I agree with you. I think in Imperial, I'm very happy to see. Uh, PNG, actually, in fairness, did this uh, several years ago. I think it was one of the first companies doing this. Um, Imperial, I'm very glad to see that it's very, very committed to this uh, topic and in, in not in a cosmetic way, in a serious way and strategic way. That makes me feel very good. Hmm. And Paola, after all these experiences that you've had um, career-wise and I would say even life-wise, if you had to go back to yourself when you were graduating from university, knowing what you know now, what type of advice would you give yourself? Okay. Um, so I will give you two answers. So one is the by the book and one is the real one, uh, which I will give you later. So the by the book, I would tell myself to be more tolerant to myself. I put a lot of pressure to myself, uh, you know, as you can imagine, sometimes you get to, to this level starting I don't think is only talent it's primarily because you're really committed and this comes from being very um keeping a very high bar to yourself this is not good enough I need to do better and I mean especially when I was younger much less now I have to say um I was always looking at what could have done better as opposed to what I did well I mean a lot of pre self pressure let's say um so that is the by the book thing. Could I just focus more on enjoying the moment and unleashing my talent as opposed to look at what I have, could have I done better? On the other side, I'm thankful for everything I've done. And I really, I really mean it. I have had in my career some good moments and bad moments, some moments that I enjoyed and moments that I didn't. Um, as all of us, and challenging, really, really tough moments also, you know, because of external environment or I remember when I was a mom for the first time and still putting a lot of pressure to myself on being a successful woman. That was tough, I have to say. But I'm really thankful to everything because it made me who I am. Um, and not only professionally, but also personally. I mean, I'm a very fulfilled mom, very happy mother. Uh, we didn't talk about that, of course, because this is not the topic, but, but my personal life has a very important role in my in my whole life. So, so at the end of the, of the day, I, be, I started becoming tolerant to myself, even in what I didn't do well in the past. Um, so at least I'm starting to apply my learning in my everyday. So, so that's, you know, my, my take out, let's say. Yeah, no, I think these are good points as well, because I, you may, reminded me of a conversation that I had also for the podcast with, with Christine May, um, who was, he's been in executive teams and now is a, a board member, that she's also had kids on the way. And then she was never like, I didn't prioritize my personal life. I just made choices and they brought me somewhere, no? So, exactly. And I think you must be at ease with the choices you made. Otherwise... Uh, it's going to be tough, you know, as a middle-aged woman, uh, I don't want to have any regrets. So. Yeah. Well, Paola, great to have you here again. I'm I'm glad we finally made it because it's been hard to coordinate the dates, but thanks so much for joining. Thank you very much for, uh, for the time and the opportunity to make some reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, how, how was it? It wasn't too bad, no? Not at all. I really enjoyed the conversation and really thank you, Paula, for sharing all this uh, experience with us. I think it's highly rewarding. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And really good to see you. Well, thanks to all our audience as well for listening or watching in this occasion us once more. And we'll see you in the next episode of the FMCG, guys. Have a great day.